you for singing. Welcome to the Divine Worship Hour uh, for the university graduation this weekend. Just a few announcements before we actually begin our service. Uh, as, um, as was mentioned in the airplane analogy, uh, we um, uh, are running late, but not to worry. The next plane does not leave until 5 p.m., and we are guaranteed to land before then. And so uh, there is no, uh, n no rush at all. And uh, all of you, we have, uh, we have checked your flights, and there's not a single person here that's uh, needed for a flight prior to 5 p.m. today. Uh, secondly, uh, tomorrow uh, at graduation at 10 a.m., we would uh, recommend that you get here early for a couple of reasons. One is there's only one car per graduate that's allowed in this more closer parking over here. And uh, so even if you have a car for graduation, I would uh, recommend that you at least come by 945. But the rest will have to be transported uh, by van or parking that is not over at the academy. So in order for you to be here on time when it starts at 10 a.m., I would recommend you plan on being here at least at 9.30 uh, so that you can be shuttled. Also, we don't have all of the shuttles here that we normally have as the Academy has taken, I think, eight of those 10 shuttles uh, this weekend to the Bay Area. And so um, uh, we only have one of a shuttle. The other one that they didn't take is not working right now. So. Um, uh, we have limited space in the shuttles, uh, so uh, that's another reason to be here on time. Also, um, uh, we uh, just um, a brief announcement. If you're following uh, the program, our uh, our congregational uh, prayer uh, has uh, has changed to Doctor and Pastor uh, John Shin. And so uh, he will be, or David Shin, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I have a, a colleague, John Shin, and uh, I sometimes interchange the names, and I think I've texted you t one time when I was supposed to text him and vice versa, since you're right next to each other, but uh, in, at least in my phone. And so uh, any other announcements that anyone knows of? Elder Tom, is there anything else I should say here uh, among this esteemed group? Yes, so yeah, in, a, in addition, of course, uh, the 5 p.m. flight that's being talked about, uh, we should mention that. That is the uh, more graduate testimonies and songs from the MA in Counseling, uh, Psychology, uh, and also the business department and religion department will be giving their testimonies at 5 p.m. today, so you want to be here for that, plus some great uh, music uh, at that time. And uh, then there's a teacher dedication ceremony uh, at, uh, at 6 p.m. for those graduating from our education department, uh, which will be uh, featured, and then uh, after that, uh, there's no more meetings until uh, 10 a.m. tomorrow. So uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, and I'll invite the uh, graduates uh, up again as we begin our divine worship service with our opening song. Please stand with us as we sing our opening song, This Is My Father's World.
you for singing. Please bow your heads in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, your children are before you. Thank you for this Sabbath. We invite your spirit to be with us now. May we leave here changed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This time is a time for tithes and offerings. And I would like to start this appeal with a story. I remember when I was growing up in Mexico, in my church, there was this uh, man, a very nice guy actually. He had, he, whenever he would see me, he would smile. He would uh, put his hand in his back pocket get out his wallet, it gave me 20 pesos. Well, right now 20 pesos is like a dollar. But for me, maybe like a five or six year old, that was a lot of money. So you can imagine how excited I was to have my 20 pesos. So, you know, every Sabbath when I would see him, I would get close to him and smile and see if he would, you know, put his hand in his pocket and give me, the, give me money. But uh, whenever that would happen, my parents would see him getting money and they would be like, no, 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 don't be giving him money. Don't be giving him money. It's like, oh, come on, he's, you know, he's being nice to me. Because every time my parents would see him, it's like, oh, you know, from those 20 pesos, you have to give tithe. And as a five-year-old, I was like, oh, wow, that's such a bad deal. You know, he just gave me 20 pesos, and I'm losing two pesos. So now I can only spend 18. And for me, that was, you know, the worst deal in the world. Now, as I got older, I understood that uh, actually that's not a... a it actually is a bad deal. It is a bad deal, but it's not a bad deal for me. It's a bad deal for God because he gives us everything and we only give 10% back. So today I want to invite you to do something. You know, we're graduates. We're uh, going to next stages of our lives. But as you go forward through your life, I want you to remember that, you know, God gave you everything. So don't just give 10%. Give everything. Give your whole life and surrender that to him. So I want to leave you with a verse found in Proverbs, sorry, I was thinking Spanish, Proverbs 11, 24 and 25, and it says, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and then there's one who withholds more than it is ripe, but it leads to poverty. The general soul will be made rich, and he who waters would also be watered himself. So, Oh, okay. We will have a QR code, or if you want to give uh, through online, you can go to the uh, Weimar Church uh, website to, to give your uh, offerings, but we won't have ushers coming forward. So as we uh, get ready to listen to the offering song, I invite you to bow our heads with me for a word prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this high Sabbath and for the opportunity uh, for all of us to be here today. As we contemplate everything that you have given us, and especially us graduates, uh, how you uh, had lead, lead us through all these four years of college, we're going to give you not just a 10%, but all of our lives to you. We want to dedicate today uh, everything and every single penny out of our pockets to you. So now as we continue forward on our next endeavors, you can also bless us. Thank you again for everything you do for us. We ask excellence in your name. Amen. Boys and girls, it's now time for the children's story, so join me up front for a story.
right, good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. How are you this morning? Good. I have a question for you. Have any of you ever been in a hailstorm before? The big hail that falls from the sky? Yes, it's that time of year when a lot of people get hail where they live. And one time, my mom, last, my mom and I last summer were caught in a hailstorm, and the hail was as big as a grapefruit. It was that big. Well, today I'm going to tell you a story about my grandpa. Um, he's actually here today. When he was younger on his farm in um, western Oklahoma, and once in a while out there they would have storms and that would pass through, and sometimes it was even a hailstorm. And when hailstorms came there, it would ruin all of the wheat fields there, and then they wouldn't be able to harvest their crops. And one day, the neighbor came to his dad and told him about some insurance that you could help to help protect your profit if, you got, if your um, fields got hailed on. And insurance is when sometimes um, you pay so that someone will repay if something gets damaged, or um, something happens to it that's not so good. So he thought about it for a while and prayed about it, and he decided that he would trust God enough that if he would protect their farm from a hailstorm without buying the insurance, that he would pay God all of the money um, that he would have spent on it. So not long after he made the decisions, they started to see it from a distance a big storm cloud come. And the family decided that they should go down to the basement in their cellar and wait until the storm passed over. And after a few minutes, they decided to open the cellar door and look outside and see how the storm was going. And they noticed as they looked around that nothing was harmed. And But they looked over at their neighbor's field and they saw that the hail had wiped out the entire crop. When they walked over to the fence to see, they saw plainly that the hail demolished the crop on one side, but on their side, it didn't touch the crop at all. What a wonderful thing that they saw about God, being able to protect an entire family from being destroyed by hail, by just trusting in God. This is one of the many miracles that his family experienced, and it demonstrated to them that God is a real God, and he's always willing to hear from us when we talk to him. And this reminds me of a, a Bible verse in Psalms 31, verse 19. It says, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. If God is willing to save a crop of wheat when we trust him, what else do you think he can do for in your life? So I challenge you this week, to place something in God's hands and to trust him with that. Would someone like to close with prayer? Jesus, thank you for the very nice day which we have. Thank you for the mission stories which we all hear. Thank you for the nice day. In Jesus' name, amen. Is now, and now time for the congregational prayer, and I invite you to stand with me as we seek the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath, this reminder of creation and our recreation back to the image of God. We thank you for your mercies, your faithfulness, your long-suffering with us, and we praise you, especially this morning, for Weimar University, for raising this institution for such a time as this, to take the gospel to the world in this generation by healing a hurting world. We uplift our graduates before you. We thank you for the work that you've started in their lives, and we know that you'll complete it. 
we pray that you would instill in each one of them a desire to serve God, to stand for the right though the heavens fall, to stand for duty and principle as the compass needle is to the North Pole, that they would rather die than lie or dishonor God. We pray that your kingdom, your honor, and your glory would be foremost in their minds. We uplift our speaker before you this morning, Dr. Mears. May you give him your words to speak. May your Holy Spirit inspire and instruct. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? Our scripture reading this morning is found in Matthew 13. That's Matthew 13, four, verses 14 through 17. Matthew 13, 14, verses 14 through 17. And the Bible says, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and shall not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brian Mears. Uh, Dr. Brian Mears uh, knew of myself before I knew of him. Uh, he uh, actually um, graduated with a theology degree from Southwestern Adventist University. And in the summers, um, started a business in Arkansas selling snow cones. And um, his, uh, he asked his dad for money to start that business, and his dad says, I don't have any money, you have to go to the bank. And so he wrote a business plan for this snow cone business. And he asked the bank for $5,000 to set this up and hire the first employees and all of that. And the bank president had an interview with him and uh, brought him in a couple of days later and then handed him a check for $5,000. And uh, that, uh, that summer, I may have some of the details wrong. This is quite a story from some time ago. But uh, that $5,000 turned into $55,000 as he set up snow cones around the state of Arkansas where there weren't uh, very many uh, snow cones for sale. In fact, he re recognized there was a deficit when he himself was looking for this. <laughs> but then he came across our book called Proof Positive. There's a chapter in that book called Sweet Tooth, Bitter Harvest. And uh, he would make his money to go to school in the, in the uh, off-season because snow cones aren't needed most of the time during school uh, time. And uh, then he would uh, make his money to go back to school. Uh, but after uh, uh, reading that book, uh, he couldn't be consistent morally, and he sold that business. He ended up uh, not only becoming a... Uh, 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 of course, with the pastoral training, uh, he also became a nurse, first an LPN, then a registered nurse, then a master's in nurse anesthesia, then a doctorate in nurse anesthesia. He and his wife uh, both practiced nurse anesthetists. Um, he actually was the head of the Nurse Anesthesia Association in the state of Florida. He's testified before Congress on multiple occasions concerning health care matters. And then around 2017, although he and his wife could not have biological children, they adopted seven children within 30 days <laughs> from a mother who uh, did not, uh, was never uh, married and had a gambling addiction. And those seven children became dramatic mental health cases that needed significant mental health. He took them to the mental health services and he couldn't get in to see the good ones. And uh, he recognized there was a lot of problems in the mental health arena in this country. And so he decided to take another doctorate. At the University of Cincinnati, he became a doctor of nurse practitioner or advanced, I think there's another uh, name for it, you might be able to give us. Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner is the actual name. Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner. And he started a mental health clinic that has now expanded to multiple mental health clinics. 
and he now, uh, his clinics see 100,000 patients per year. And he stopped his nurse anesthesia, and he's just uh, in the uh, psychiatric business. He hires psychiatrists, he has mental health providers, full mental health services, and uh, he uh, came across us in this last year um, to shadow the depression and anxiety recovery program uh, to, uh, make, uh, to help learn from that and make his clinics more complementary. He does state we need a lot more biblically and conservative-based mental health providers. And so he has encouraged us even to actually start a psychiatric nurse practitioner program ourselves here at Weimar that he and his team might actually uh, help us with. But uh, n number one ab about Brian Mears is his number one objective is actually to serve the Lord. He's evangelistic. He is one staff to the Lord. He also... Uh, takes time off and does evangelism himself, and I think we might be hearing a little bit about that, uh, his exciting aspect of using the threefold ministry that Christ has set aside for particularly winning souls in these last days. And so, Dr. Mears, I can think of no one more appropriate to give our commencement divine worship hour uh, than yourself in 2024, and welcome to Weimar University. Thank you, Dr. Nedley. Thank you for the invitation. I hate hearing about myself. It makes me so uncomfortable. <coughs> he asked me to give him a few details, and he remembered so much. I can't believe he remembered about the snow cone shop that I had. <laughs> but God is so good. He knows how to put the Lego pieces of our life together to make it make sense as we continue growing in him. Can you, can you really say amen to God is good? Amen. amen. It's good to hear us Say praise the Lord together. Hallelujah. You know, I just came back from Africa, actually. I was doing an evangelistic series over there, and they taught me how to say hallelujah. I'm not going to do it for you here because you have to yell. But think of yourself yelling hallelujah. It is so amazing. And I wanted to do that when, this, when the orchestra was playing and the choir was playing. How amazing is the music here? I am so thankful for Weimar and for what it stands for. So again, thank you for the invitation to speak here for for today and for graduation. I'm very excited to present this topic to you that I pray will be immediately applicable to your lives today and how you witness to others. I love to teach about the brain, so I have to start with a basic understanding of the brain and then we'll go from that into mission work. So the title of my message today is The Great Rewiring and the Call to Medical Ministry. Now that may be a little odd title, may be interesting, but I hope by the end of this lecture today that you will understand how our brains are under constant attack, how Satan is rewiring our brains for that moment of final deception when we will choose. We're either sealed by God or we receive the mark of the beast. My friends, I believe that that's coming very soon. I believe that Jesus is about to return, and there is nothing more important than serving him today. And the way you produce students by integrating faith with health is, is brilliant. That is God's right hand of the gospel. And I'm going to tell you some things today that I promise you don't know because I just received the information just, just last night. There's a huge evangelistic series happening right now in Papua New Guinea. And I can't wait to share some of the details from that right here today. So as we start today, I just want to invite us again to invite the Lord's presence. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here to serve you. Lord, we invite your spirit here. May your words be heard today. May this message be encouraging. May it help for us to understand the eminence of your return and our duty to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so as we get started today, I have two questions for you. Two questions to start off. Do you believe that Jesus is returning soon? Amen. Do you believe that Jesus is returning soon? Yes. And do you believe that your actions demonstrate that you believe that Jesus is returning soon? Yeah. Yeah. I praise the Lord for hearing you say yes. Many times churches are quiet when you say that. Do you believe that your actions are demonstrating that the Lord is going to return soon? 
So I have a number of verses up on the screen. I'm going to read them together, okay? I'm going to read them together. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I will praise you, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows well. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Do you find it encouraging today that we either have or that we can have the mind of Christ? Amen. That's hard to contemplate, isn't it? I hear these wonderful testimonies, and I've heard some of the struggles in life. Thank you for the message about prayer last night. That's a real message that applies to every single one of us. We still have struggles in our prayer life, I'm, I'm sure. But do you find it amazing that we can actually have the mind of Christ? And there is a moment coming, a bifurcating moment in history, where we will be sealed or we will be lost. And that moment is coming soon. Now, let's just start with a very brief overview of the brain structure. So the brain is phenomenal. It's so complex. Science cannot keep up. They can't recreate the brain. It consists of approximately 100 billion neurons with about 100, 100 trillion synapses. Now, I'm going to explain what a synapse is. But just supporting this 100, or this, uh, uh, 100 billion neurons, there's about 5 trillion support cells that support these neurons. And did you know every single day we make about 35,000 different decisions every day? Our brains are so complex. And yet in their complexity, it's very small. The human brain weighs an average of 3 pounds. And for the average person, that's about 2% of the body weight. But in 2% of our body weight, it consumes 20% of all metabolism. This brain that God has given us is a powerhouse. It is what separates us from animals. We have this frontal cortex that helps us think. It's where we have logic and strategy. It's where we have reasoning power. It's where we experience love. It's where we experience our connections with God. And our frontal cortex is under attack. It is completely under attack. Now, my role in the, in the job that I'm in, I consider it a mission. I like to bring objective fact into psychiatry. And it's easy to do that in today's world. We can bring objective fact into many diagnoses and help people see that the reason they feel this way is because they actually have a diseased brain. They have had an attack on their physical brain structure. And now we have to help repair that. But God has given us resource to be able to repair these. Now I want you to look on this screen. I love this picture. This is an electron scanning microscope of neurons. And what you see in this neuron, the long projections, the long projections leading up to that little round ball, that's called an axon. Axons are these very long, or they're, they're the primary nerves in our brain. And then they go through this big round thing called the cell body, and then it projects into these finger-like projections called dendrites. At the end of the dendrite, what you see this little tiny bulb, that's called a synaptic bulb. And in, in between that synaptic bulb, you have a little space. This little space is the synaptic cleft. Now the reason I'm explaining all this is because our brains are under attack. And you'll see how our brain is being rewired today. But with this synaptic bulb, it's looking for a good connection or a bad connection, it doesn't matter. Whatever we're programming ourselves with, whatever information that we give ourselves, these synapses phone a friend, they find a connection, and they form a memory. All right? So as they get close to each other, neurotransmission starts to happen. And then the neurotransmitters, things like dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine and glutamate and GABA and all kinds of things, they communicate in this itty-bitty little tiny gap. So you have to have a current of electricity running through this neuron that goes to this synaptic bulb and it programs the release of neurotransmitters. Now, I share this because the brain is super complex. We have so many neurons in there. And right now, as I speak, you are having new synaptic connections. Right now. Our brains are not static they're considered neuroplastic. That means they're malleable and movable. Right now, as, you, as you're listening, you're having new memories created, new information's going into your brain. 
And hopefully the strength of that is profound, and it's not one little connection that happens, but hopefully it's a group of connections that happens. So that what you're looking at here is it's a thought. It's somebody thinking about something. And rather than one neuron firing, which is the green that you see, you see a group of neurons firing. Now with that in mind, the information that we surround ourselves, do you see how important it can be inside our physical brain structure? Our physical brain structure is what maintains memory, is what maintains connection. It is vitally important that we give ourselves good information. But I would argue that we're living in a moment of Earth's history that has never happened before. A moment called the Great Rewiring. We're living in a new time called the information age in which billions and billions of data points, they enter our minds every single day. And most of these data points anymore, they're synthetic data points that we allow into our senses, our eyes, our ears, our smells, our touch, our taste. And this makes, this, this upregulates excitatory neurotransmitters and addictive neurotransmitters. Now let me explain what synthetic data is. Synthetic data is world-made data. It is, it is the cartoons that we feed our kids. It is the music we listen to. It is, the, it is the constant scrolling through social media. That is synthetic data. Synthetic data is largely in today's world very harmful for us. If that weren't so, you wouldn't see the tech billionaires send their kids to schools with no technology but they do send their kids to schools with no technology, while we give our kids tons of technology. And in that technology, it is causing a brain that is addicted to the world. It is causing a brain that fires incessantly, like you see on the screen, where huge portions of the brain is so upregulated with, with the excited neurotransmitter called glutamate and with dopamine that our brains scream in pain when we don't have that stimulation. Have you ever seen kids that had an iPad and then the, the parents took the iPad away and the kid kicks and screams and throws a fit? They have temper tantrums? My friends, that is an addiction. That's an addiction. That's the brain saying, feed me more dopamine. Feed me more dopamine. We are living in a very unique time, a time in which we have a need for more and more dopamine or more and more information to just achieve the same amount of dopamine that we have every day. In essence, right now, I would argue that the average person in the world has an addict's mind, an addict's mind. You know why? Because the average person here in the United States, do you know how many hours the average teenager now from 8 to 18 spends on screen time? Not educational screen time. How many hours a day does the average person, 8 to 18, spend on screen time? Anybody guess? 6.4 hours. Non-educational time is for raising our kids with synthetic data. It's easy. Give them an iPad, stick them off in a corner, and then our lives seemingly become easier as parents. But what we're doing is we're sending our minds on a neurotransmitter roller coaster. It's this constant, incessant, up and down, high and low of stimulation. And when we don't have the stimulation, we bottom out like an addict bottoms out. So in today's information-driven society, we find ourselves in this comprehensive rewiring of our brain. It is a physical fight that's happening in our mind right now, a physical rewiring. My friends, I was drawn to psychiatry, not only looking for help for family members, but because I understood that there is a fight in information, a physical fight for our mind. This isn't just hypothetical, but I was, I was really, I really wanted to know, how does the mark of the beast happen? Meaning, how do we get to a moment where everybody in earth will say yes or no? How do we get to that point? Well, I believe that what we're seeing is data that shows how we're gonna get to that point. It's a mind of addiction. It's a mind so upregulated that it lives in such fear and anxiety. It has disproportionate neurotransmitters to health that, well, the brain's diseased. The brain is sick. And so what we saw was in 2008, these new things called smartphones came out. 
right? Smartphones came out in 2008. In 2010, data started being tracked about depression and anxiety and self-harm habits of teenagers. And it skyrocketed after 2010. It's a very sad thing that we're experiencing now. But the Bible tells us what's going to happen. In Proverbs 23, verse 7, you know what Proverbs 23, verse 7 says? For as a man thinketh, so he becomes. So if we're constantly thinking about satanic information, and that's really what Satan's putting in front of us, we can use information for good, can we not? But the majority are not using it for good. The majority are constantly scrolling, thinking about things that are completely unhealthy for them. So now we're just navigating through this new environment where we are addicted to screens and we have indiscriminate scroll time. Indiscriminate, meaning we don't know what's right and wrong. One of the worst things you can ever do is just get on social media or on the news or on your scroll and just search and you don't know what you're looking for. You want to search something healthy, then go for it. Look up a specific subject, but never get on the never-ending scroll. That is, in my opinion, a very satanic thing. It is something that is it's bottomless. It's a bottomless pit. It never stops. And in that, our brains are being rewired, and they are being rewired to separate us from God. Separate us from God. So as we go through this incessant scroll and, we, and we're bombarded with digital information constantly, our frontal cortex actually devolves. It's the frontal cortex that stops functioning well. The frontal cortex, the very thing that God gave us to reason with, is what's under attack. And it shrinks and it atrophies, while other areas of the brain strengthen. Areas in the limbic system that deal with fears and anxieties and emotions, they strengthen. They gain real estate in the brain. My friends, the fight for real estate in our brain is real. It is absolutely real. I'm going to fast forward for a moment, and I'm going to get to this thing called the eye dilemma. Have you ever heard of the eye dilemma? You probably haven't because I just made the slide last night. But the eye dilemma, I believe, is a real problem. The eye dilemma is the iPhone, the iPad, the I want, the I need, the I must have, the I don't know why I act like this. It's the I dilemma. You see, we're training our children right now to use the word I before God. We're using the word I all the time. We live in a very selfish society here. We live in a very confused society here. Just last Sunday, I had to go to the iPhone store because my, my, my um, iPhone was damaged. So they're trying to repair it. It took about two hours. And so while I was there sitting on the, um, at the Genius Bar, there's this father that shows up. And he was, he was as severe ADHD as I've ever seen. He was like a ping pong ball. He couldn't quit talking. He was everywhere. And I'm just sitting there like this. I'm finding this amazing. It's like a study in psychiatry. And, so, and then all of a sudden, the, the person helping him gets up and leaves. And then he looks at me and he goes, hey, hey, I, for, I forgot my two-year-old out in the car. I got to go get her. <laughs> so he goes and brings this little girl in. And he sets her down on the table. And then he's like a ping pong ball again. And he's like, hey, hey, all right, this is the deal. I got to have an iPad mini for her. And I want cellular capability because, because I want her to be happy. I want this thing on 24-7. I want this thing programmed to, to cartoons so she never, ever has to stop watching it because I want her to be happy. This wasn't a short conversation either. He went off for many, many minutes. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm at this you know, case study. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, about in tears because the real world is our minds are so destroyed that now we equate happiness to information. We equate happiness to this I thing that we're experiencing. And this poor kid, I felt pity and empathy for her of, of the way that she's going to be raised. I mean, this father truly believes the path to happiness is to give a two-year-old an iPad so she never has to be off of it. And when you think back to that previous picture, how is her brain going to be wired? Can you see how the brain, with the wrong information, wires completely incorrectly? Physical structure changes to where 
the information that we have in our brain, when we exercise it enough, it becomes our reality. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. We can believe a lie, can we not? We've all believed lies before. I like to do a study in perception and do it in the crowd. I'm not going to do that today, but I promise you, your perceptions can be wrong. Your perceptions can be wrong, and we can believe a lie. There is a study that I like to talk about that was done at Harvard, and it was a study <coughs> where they had people watch accidents. You just watch an accident, and then you tell, who did it? Well, it was a color car. Tell the scenario. In a controlled setting, only 45% of people got this information right. It's because our senses fell us. Why do our senses fail us? Well, largely, our brains are damaged with the information that we've received. Second Thessalonians, I'm going to give you a whole barrage of scripture now to talk about what does the Bible say about this great rewiring and how do we protect our minds? Well, the mindset of the end time world is well defined in scripture, is it not? And do you believe that we're coming upon an extraordinarily difficult time in earth's history? Are we not coming up on the final moments of earth's history? Did Jesus not give us signs? Did he not tell us in the Bible what to look for, what to expect? He tells us in, in multiple chapters, but specifically in Matthew 24, that there will be signs of the times to pay attention to. And my friends, those signs are happening. Now, we live in a bubble sometimes in our communities. It's very easy for us to not recognize the signs are all around us, but they are here. And now when you add the, the evolution of information and the way it's consuming and destroying our brains, can you start to see how there is a bifurcating moment coming up in the earth's history where we're going to say yes or no to Jesus? Every person on earth. So let's run through a number of scriptures real quick. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deceptions among those who perish because what they did not receive a love of the truth they didn't receive a love of the truth that they may be saved and for this reason god sent them strong delusions that they should believe a lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness this is a loaded text is it not but we can look all around. We can talk to our friends and family and neighbors and coworkers and say, do they love the truth? Do they love the truth? Do we see how strong delusion is coming? We see in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the end time people have no spiritual discernment. In Ephesians 4 verse 14, it says that the end time people will have unstable and ever-changing minds. Do we see that now? Philippians verse three, eight, uh, or chapter 3, 18 through 19 says that the focus of the end time people will be on earthly things. And in Romans 8, uh, 1, 18 through 32, it says, this one's really loaded. So it says in verse 18 that there's going to be a suppression of truth in unrighteousness. In verse 23, it talks about how we're going to be given up to debased thinking, things like evolution. In 26, 27, and 28, it talks about homosexuality. In, in verse 32, it says that we will sin and approve of sin. Do we see the society that we're living in now meet all the definitions of that? We are living in the end times. Romans Romans 8, verses 5 through 8 says that the end time people will be carnally minded and that mind will be at enmity against God. And in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, that we will depart from the faith. Why? Because we do not keep the commandments. And in 2 Timothy, we see that there will be deceiving and being deceived. And we will turn from the truth. And then in Matthew 15, Jesus says, they will give me lip service, and in vain will they worship me because they do not keep my commandments. My friends, we can look through this and say, we can see how this is all happening in our very lives. 
And when we pair this up with this digital information overload, the synthetic information that we're constantly propagandized to, our brains are actively being destroyed. Isaiah 6 and verse 9 and 2 Timothy 3, 7 are really important to this message. But let's start with Mark 13, 14 through 15. Jesus quotes Isaiah 6 through 9, and he says, Hearing you will hear, but you shall not understand. And seeing you will see, but you will not perceive. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Isn't it amazing that God says we can be blessed with his eyes and his ears? But the vast majority of people, we talk to them, yet they don't respond. Have you had that communication with people? Have you tried to witness to people and you're like, I'm telling you the truth. Look at it right here. I'm like, mm, I don't see that. This verse applies to them. Our incessant scroll through digital content, it is rewiring our, our nervous system to where we do something called sympathetic overdrive. The sympathetic nervous system is running on high alert all the time. It's like we're living in fight or flight or fear constantly. So depressions and anxieties, they're through the roof in our society. And at the core, the prefrontal cortex is being, is being attacked. So we can teach all we want, but many people won't hear us. And the more we get to the end, well, I believe in something called the latter rain. I'm going to show you something that's happening this very weekend that, that I believe will prove that point, but the truth is under attack. The truth is under attack. What happens to Christians that do not study, that do not know, and that do not love God's word? What, Second Thessalonians will what does 2 Thessalonians tell us about the Christians? Remember, that, that, that book was written to Christians who didn't study, know, or love the word of God. God will send them strong delusion. Now, that's going to happen. This is real. This is not hypothetical. Our friends, our family, our co-workers, our loved ones, our neighbors will receive strong delusion unless we allow God to put our feet in front of them and our mouths to be unloosed so that we can witness to them. So many people will be lost because of our inaction. So today's message is really a call to action. It's to help understand that here in this last moment of earth's history, Satan is using information to separate us from God. He's using information. We have to counter that. We have to counter that by allowing God to work through us so that our friends and families do not receive this terrible thing called the mark of the beast coming up. But here in 2 Thessalonians again, we see our friends and family and neighbors, many church members, well, they didn't receive the love of the truth. And so God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth and, the tr and, the, and they had pleasure in unrighteousness. I have a family member right now that I care deeply for that grew up Seventh-day Adventist. But she's departed from the faith. And she goes to another church now. Why? Because when I have conversations with her, she says, but I don't receive any judgment there. I, they never talk about sin. I can do anything I want there, and I'm completely accepted. Is that not what 2 Thess Thessalonians is talking about? It didn't receive the love of the truth, so strong delusions can definitely be received by them. So just to review in 2 Timothy here, they're not going to endure sound doctrine, but this is something that, that's really important for our own lives right now, that many will have a form of godliness. They're going to look the part, they're going to act the part, but they're going to have a little bit of error. And so the Bible says from them, we're supposed to stay away from them. Have you ever met people that tries to convert you? And you're sitting there going back and forth? There comes a time that we have to say, you know, our witness can be much greater in a different area than just dealing with one person. Now, that's hard, but you go over to another country like Africa and watch what happens. I just came back from Africa, and hundreds and hundreds of people were baptized. Hundreds of people. But I can sit here all day long till I'm blue in the face and argue with lots of people that I'm around, and nothing changes with them. It's because 
they don't receive the love of the truth. They have a form of godliness. They go to church. They say, well, I believe in God, but I don't have to do anything. I don't have to have any works. I guess they don't believe in, in faith without works is dead. I'm going to tell you a story about, this is a real story that happened in my own hometown over Christmas, a story of indoctrination. This is what's happening in the world right now. There's a private school, a college preparatory school. It's, it's a, a very expensive school where I live, and a lot of wealthy people send their kids to school there, and they get great, edu great academic education. So you wouldn't think that this indoctrination could happen there, but it did. So over Christmas, one of my great, one of my friends, he, um, he was telling me the story. His daughter goes to school there, and she's in 10th grade. And she calls him during finals week, and she's in tears. And she says, Dad, they just canceled my semester exam. You know I've been working so hard for this. I have an 89, and I've been going to tutoring, and I'm ready for this test, but they canceled my test. And he said, what? And she said, not only did they cancel my test, they canceled every exam from this point forward. And he said, there's something wrong here. And so my friend, he's a very powerful per person where I live, so he said, honey, I'm going to call you back in a minute. He calls the principal, gets the principal on the phone, and he says, this is what my daughter just said. Is that true? He said, yes. He said, we've canceled all exams. And he said, what are you talking about? And he said, our new superintendent of schools does not believe in, in testing because it stresses people out. She believes that everybody should be treated equally across the board. And he's, my friend, he's not somebody you really want to mess around with. He said, he said okay. He said, I'm going to call you back in an hour. So in that hour, he and a team of people, they started researching this new superintendent. And they saw she has a PhD in pedagogy, and that's a form of education. And they found her thesis, and they read this thesis, and it was horrifying. Her thesis was, <clears throat> her goal was to infiltrate private education so they put people in place in every single private education facility across the country so that they can teach the, the kids that their parents are intrinsically racist and biased and bad and evil. Their goal was to destroy the family units. All right? So my friend wasn't very happy at all. And it turns out the story even gets a little worse because the kids were not reporting to their parents some of the things that were going on in that school. Because one of the philosophies of the superintendent, it was to promote ideologies that are, of course, anti-biblical. And so they were promoting the LGBTQ lifestyle. Come to school, change clothes, be a different gender. This is in a college preparatory class. This is in high school. And then they started promoting another weird thing where you can identify as animals identifying as animals. So my friend found out that they had put litter boxes in the bathrooms. I'm not kidding you. And now there were like nine kids at that school that were identifying as cats. I'm not kidding you. This is the real world that we're living in. Satan is destroying our brains and tearing our families apart because these kids didn't even talk to their parents about it. So... Praise the Lord, in that one case, um, that my friend was able to call a meeting, and within about four hours, he had that person removed, and almost everybody that worked at that school that's in any position of authority. And so they were able to hit delete on them and eradicate that nonsense. But our brains are being destroyed. Why? Because we do not love the truth. If we love the truth and if we're teaching our kids truth from, from the foundation, our kids, we can trust that they're going to make good decisions. I am so excited to hear the testimonies of these young people that are graduating, knowing that their number one goal is they've got relationships with God, that their number one goal is soul winning, that whatever prof profession they go in, it is a ministry. So they're not part of this I dilemma. But the world does not love the truth. Now, what is the truth? Well, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So if the world does not love the truth, what is the world really saying? I don't love Jesus. I don't love Jesus. Now, people idealize 
the word Jesus, meaning they create a, an idol around the word Jesus, but it's not the real Jesus. They use his name to worship Satan. They don't love the truth. They love satanic principles. And the reason they don't love the truth, well, it's because we're so caught up in, in life, in the pride of life, the things that we like. We love ourselves. We love our jobs. We love our sports more than we love the truth. Now, I'll tell you, a family member of mine, they really do not go to church because sports interfere with, with church. That's it. Sports interfere with church. And so nothing can get in the way of the sports. Now, I'm going to tell you one other story of a patient that I just had. This patient, it was a new patient intake, and, um, and so I'm doing a, it was a telemedicine appointment. And as this lady and I start engaging, I say, all right, today I'm going to do a biological, psychological, social, and spiritual assessment. And when I said spiritual, she kind of perked up. She's in her mid-50s, and she said, she's been through a lot of different people in psychiatry before. And she said, well, I can tell you right now that I'm under a spiritual attack. And I said, I'm glad that you said that. I said, I'm really happy you said that because that's where I want to go with this conversation. But right now, let's not talk about that. I'm going to talk about the biological stuff and the psychological stuff and the social stuff. So this lady, as we get to the spiritual stuff, she says, I'm a Christian. She says, and so as I'm evaluating, well, tell me how you were raised. Tell me about your parents. Tell me about their parents. She was raised in a conservative Christian home, but then she got drawn into the charismatic movement. And as she started becoming more charismatic, and she's part of a charismatic church, there was an accident right out in front of that church in which her daughter, who was an adult, and her granddaughter was in the car, and they pulled out of the church, and somebody hit them. And it killed the granddaughter. And the mother was pregnant, and it killed that baby. All right, so she had two losses at one time. And <clears throat> she said that very day, she said, my granddaughter started visit, visiting me every day. I said, explain what that means. She says, well, I see my granddaughter. She comes and visits me every day in my room. And I said, uh, I said does anybody else see your granddaughter? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, my, my husband sees. And so you have to consider, is this real for this person, or do other people corroborate this? So I talked to her husband, and he says, yes, no, it's, it's true. After our granddaughter died, things started happening in our home. And he said, I didn't see our granddaughter at first. Only she saw our granddaughter. But things started moving in our house. And she said, they said, you know, at our dining room table, all six chairs, they'll move simultaneous out. And so he said, he said, I know, I know. In the Bible, shouldn't be believing this. And I said, all right, what are you doing about it? And they said, well, we don't go to church anymore. And they said, we actually believe in God, but we don't believe in the Bible anymore because we know that the things that are happening to us are against what the Bible teaches, so the Bible has to be wrong. So I said, who else have you talked to about this? Well, we're consulting a well-known medium that's helping, us, that's helping us communicate with our granddaughter. The point is, they knew the Bible, but because of an emotional, a traumatic experience, seducing spirits came into their home and are now tormenting them and keeping them completely separated and segregated from God's truth. They don't study his word anymore. They once believed, but now they don't. Our world does not love truth. Do we think that those things can start manifesting more? We know that Ellen White tells us that, right? The two main things in the end are going to be seducing spirits and Sunday sacredness. And so seducing spirits, if you haven't experienced them, or if you don't know people that have, well, Keep your eyes open because you probably will. The world is simply addicted to sin. In Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doing, are we living our lives full of the fruits of his doing? Do our lives represent the fruits of his doing? Are we sealed with the testimony of Jesus? We can be. Isn't it wonderful to know that the Lord does search our heart because he cares about us. He tests our mind. He puts thoughts in there like, 
I really do need to pray better. I need to pray more. I need to, I need to study the word more. I need to associate with like-minded people so that we can bear better fruit. God does have a solution. God has a solution, and I find this so encouraging. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Is that not beautiful? He's given us a prescription on how we're to interact with people. He's saying, now I know that there are people that are in opposition to me, but if you're gentle, if you can teach, if you're patient with people, and if you're humbly correcting people who are in opposition to me, he may grant them repentance. That's why we're here right now. It is to be that vessel that he can work through, to be his eyes and his ears and his feet and his mouth right here so that people can come to know him, turn from their ways, and accept this wonderful gift of eternal life. And, and Peter says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Amen. We can be holy. We can be sanctified. Are our lives sanctified now? We can be. It's a promise. It's a guarantee that our brains can be mentally fit for the end. We can be mentally fit for the end. And we must be mentally fit for the end. And we must, be, we, we must have physical training in this brain. So how do we do that? How do we do that? We study scripture. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I find it so encouraging that we can have God's eyesight. Find it so encouraging. And he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. When we surrender control to him, he will provide the clarity we need to navigate through life's challenge if we acknowledge him in his ways. So don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, the renewing of your mind, how often does that happen? Is that a one-time event? It's daily, right? Are we not supposed to die to self every single day? Because the battle for our mind is every single day. It's every single second. If we don't have the habits to have our brains wired correctly, renewed correctly, well, we need to make some lifestyle adjustments. We need to make some lifestyle adjustments, and that's the truth. We need to pray and communicate with God. We need to study his word a lot. We need to memorize scripture, and we need to assemble together. Did we not experience something over the last few years that tried to separate us from assembling together? And many people still haven't came back to church. That's what happens when we're not together. We need each other's company. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we're called to action in these verses here. We're given prescriptions. We're given an outline on how to keep our physical body and our mental health really intact. So wherever, where, therefore, whatever you eat or drink, do all in the glory of God. We need to glorify God. We need to praise God. You know, when we're praising God, we can't live in fear. When we're praising God, we're not going to have the worldly anxieties among us. If this verse right here really opened my eyes a few years ago, and that was, for once you were in darkness, but now you're in light, walk as children of light, finding what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We are supposed to expose sin, are we not? We're supposed to call sin, sin. We're supposed to do that in gentleness and humility, but we are to guide people to God's law. God's law is what seals our mind, and we need to direct people back to God's principles. So, quick thing 
I'm not going to talk any more about me, but I was, I was really called into medical missions for multiple reasons. And I believe that I was called into medical missions to expose <coughs> darkness and to provide mental, physical, and spiritual healing. We must expose sin like we write out a diagnosis. We need to identify those. I know that Pastor Don does a great job at doing that and the way he, he interacts with people and questions people around the Ten Commandments. It's a beautiful thing. And so you write out the diagnosis, and then you put together an individualized treatment plan. It's a prescription that has God's principles at the core. So having my own children, that a couple of them needed some mental health care, I'll tell you one quick story of a reason, of a reason I'm so passionate about mental health is because one of my children needed some therapy. And the therapist that I put her in with came highly recommended, and seemed very good, but within about a month or six weeks of my own daughter going to a therapist, my daughter comes out and she says, I'm gay. She was 13 at that time. And I said, I had to calm down. And I said, what does that mean to you? And she says, I'm coming out. I'm gay. And I said, so I loved on her and just said, I said, we're going to work through this. Well, we did work through it. She was not gay at all. But the therapist had an agenda. That therapist, it turns out, was gay. And that therapist's goal was to take young teenagers and try to convert them into this new ideology. That was my own kid. And so if my own kid, and I had this basic understanding at that time, was already getting, getting assimilated into the satanic mindset, said, we can't do this. We have to create a company that has spirituality, has God's principles at the core, at the foundation, so that people can be safe. And for that reason, God has blessed us, and we've expanded a lot. And we'll continue expanding because the fight's real, and, and there's no end. So we'll continue fighting this fight. So I want to share a few things about things that are going on in the world. So I believe that I'm called to medical missions. I've always wanted to be a missionary. When I first went to Southwestern, my goal was to be a missionary. I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to be an evangelist. I wanted to travel. But Lord led me in a different direction. I didn't know why at that time, but it makes a lot of sense now. But finally, I'm getting to do medical missionary work. So I was just in Tanzania this year for almost a month. I went to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania with Adventist World Radio, and we had a, uh, a wonderful mission trip. What you're looking at here is the site I was at, and the site I was at was, it was a soccer field. It was super hot. We were out all day. I had a medical clinic in the morning, and then every morning after I had the medical clinic, then I had service. And it was rigorous, and it was challenging, and it was, it was very tiring. But what I saw over there was beautiful. People are hungry for the Word of God. People are hungry for the truth. You know, over there, people have Scripture memorized. They have the hymnals memorized. They don't have phones. They don't have money. So they don't have things laying around. So they have to put it in their minds. So I was very, very happy to see people that knew Scripture and that wanted to know Scripture more. So I started asking. As soon as I got to... Um, the first day I was there, I went to a church, not to my physical location, and there were no Bibles. There was a few Bibles that were kind of torn up. And I said, uh, I said where are the Bibles? And, and he said, uh, we don't have Bibles. He said, very few people actually have Bibles here. So I was super privileged to be able to purchase and hand out 400 Bibles to the people that came to the meeting. And some of the people that came to the meeting are the, the people standing back here. You see a little hut back there across the soccer field, all the way at the end. There were these Bora, uh, Bora Bora drivers, or Bo, they're called Bora Bora drivers, border to border. And they drove little motorcycles, motorcycles that were taxi cabs. And I didn't know any of them were actually listening. We had huge speakers up. And the message that I spoke over there, it was, it was a prophecy series. And I was, I was in between a very large Catholic church and an Anglican church. So they positioned me real well. And here I am talking about the mark of the beast and all this stuff. Well, these gentlemen, they're listening. They came every day and they listened. 
And so I would interact with them. And when they received their Bibles, they were so excited, so thankful. We had tremendous amount of baptisms there. This gentleman you see with the pink microphone, he's not Seventh-day Adventist. He's the mayor of that community. And he came up and he said, I love Seventh-day Adventist. He said, you're so different. You're peculiar. You love the community. You love each other. You're not addicted to all this bad stuff. He goes, all I see are people that are alcoholics and drug addicts. And he said, and you're not. I love you guys. And he welcomed us back any time that we could come. When I was there, there was an accident that happened. And I want to tell you, I have little faith. I still have little faith. I need a better prayer life. So one thing that I'd always ask the Lord to do before I would go up on stage is, Lord, may your image be seen, not mine. Lord, may your words be spoken, not mine. The very first day I was there, I made an appeal. And as I made this appeal, lots of people came forward. And the first person forward to the center of the stage was a Muslim gentleman. And this Muslim gentleman, he is looking at me with arms outstretched, and he is so intent. And it made me kind of uncomfortable, actually, because he was, he was close to me, and he's just staring at me, and he's crying. And I finish up the appeal, we have prayer, and then behind, we had a prayer tent. And anybody that came forward, we'd go into the back and talk to them. So this gentleman comes in the back, and he kneels down right in front of me, and he is just in tears. And I'm, I have no idea what's going on. And so I asked the translators who were pastors, I said, I said, what's going on with him? And they said, he said he sees Jesus. And I said, I'm not Jesus. I just said it like that. I said, I'm not Jesus. And then I said, I said my friend, I'm not Jesus. I said, Jesus in heaven. And, uh, and he goes, I see Jesus. And then the pastor reached, he leans over to me and he says, he sees Jesus. And I was like, I just prayed that prayer. Will you be seen, not me? And there are things that I don't know. Like I go over there and the Lord's really speaking to people through visions and dreams. It's not something I've personally experienced. But in the Muslim community, that seems to be a real thing that's happening. And so this gentleman really proclaimed that he saw Jesus. And he gave his life to the Lord. Now, there was an accident that happened as well. And I want to show you this. I've never been part of a true miracle healing before where prayer actually did it. But on the day that we were baptizing here, there was an accident coming to the baptism. And one of these uh, taxis, they, they, it was an open cart in the back, and there were a number of people coming to the baptism, and they went off an embankment, and they flipped over. And so um, um, one of the guys that's fixing to get baptized, he comes limping in, and his leg's all bloody, and he has bandage. And if you could see this water, I was scared of that water. That water was nasty looking. It was brown. It looked horrible. And I was like, please don't let him get in that water. Like his leg is, he has, he has some large gashes on it, open wounds. I said, please don't let him get in that water. Pastor's like, oh, you're fine, let's go. <laughs> so he baptized him. But another person that was in that taxi cab with him, this was, this was her, and I'm going to show you the video on this. Now, if you could see, I don't know if you can see well, but on the left side, this is two days after the accident. The first day of the accident, this young lady, she still came to the meeting. And the, I'm in a soccer field, and it's just dirt, and it's really, it's nasty out there. And she had puncture wounds on the bottom of her feet. And I was, I was worried. I told her, I said, I'm worried you're going to get an infection. And so let's go to the pharmacy and get you some first aid stuff. Let's clean up your foot, and let's try to prevent an infection. Well, two days later, she has 102 fever, 120 heart rate, and she, she ended up getting my phone number, and she called me at like 1 a.m. This is 1 a.m. She calls me, and, and I said, send me a picture. And over there, it's not like you... It's not like our healthcare system. You don't just go to an emergency room. Now, they have emergency rooms, and they actually have decent health care, but you have to have money to pay for that. And most people have no money, and without money, you're not going to get access to care. So she sent, me this, she sent me this picture here, and I'm going to show this. So in this, you'll see her, her legs from her just below her knee down was very swollen, very bruised, Black, blue, purple, all around. Her leg was, it, it wasn't a pretty leg. She hadn't been to the hospital or saw anybody. 
And she says, I don't feel well. Can you take me to the hospital? And I said, I, said, I don't know how to even find you. We're in, we're in this city of six million people. And uh, I said, but I'll call the pastors and I'll see if the pastors can go pick you up tomorrow and, that, and we'll get you to a hospital tomorrow morning. I said, but let's have prayer right now. So we had prayer, and this was at 1 a.m. At 6 a.m. the next morning, this is what her foot looked like. There's no bruising, there's no swelling, and she says, I don't need to go to the hospital. She goes, I'm completely fine. I said, I said, what? I was like, I have such little faith. I mean, I had the prayer that Jesus could be seen, and he was, but I didn't believe it. I had a prayer that her foot could be healed, but when she called me and told me her foot was healed, I didn't believe it, you know? So the point is, even here, we still have such a work to do. Now, there was another miracle story. I'm not going to show you this video because it's about three minutes, but there's a bridge right here, and we had just left the meeting for the night. And we get halfway up this bridge, and our car dies. Well, it's completely out of gas. And again, they don't have much money over there. And I kept asking, let me buy you gas. Because it was on empty the whole time. And it stressed me out. Because driving over there, it's scary. I mean, it's no joke. I don't want to drive over there. And so the most stress I had, it wasn't preaching. It wasn't 100 degrees. It wasn't being out all day. It was sitting in that car driving. I was scared to death. Anyway, we make it halfway up this bridge, <clears throat> and the car dies, and it's completely out of gas. And we stop. And then he, <clears throat> he start, the driver's starting to panic a little bit. And the pastor, he's kind of giggling a little bit, sitting in the back. And he says, start it again. And he starts it. And, the, and we get up to the top of that bridge, and then it completely dies again. It's completely off. We make it up the bridge, and then... There's no place to get off the road. The concrete comes in on you, and so it's this two lanes, and it just goes for many kilometers. And uh, I was like, well, I guess we're going to be pushing here in a minute. I don't know what we're going to do, but, but this is what happened. When we got to the top of that hill, we started coasting. And we were at 10 kilometers an hour. And we went, and we, we actually hit another, another um, elevation, and for three kilometers, we had an elevation, and our car kept going at 10 kilometers an hour for three kilometers, and it never changed speed, and there was no power to the car. There was no gas to the car, and me and the pastor, we're just laughing. We're like, wow, there's an angel really pushing this car. I mean, like, I could walk faster than this, but there's an angel pushing the car. And, and our car moved and kept going for three kilometers until we made it into a gas station on the other side of the interstate. It was amazing. I was sitting in a vehicle that I know had a miracle happening in it. It was so cool. Now, right now as we speak, there's a huge mission trip. It's probably the largest mission trip that um, Adventist organization has ever done in the history of the world. Right now, in Papua New Guinea, Adventist World Radio has sponsored this, general conferences involved, and they have 2,300 sites right now as we speak. 2,300 sites. The Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea is Seventh-day Adventist. And so there's a big promotion of Seventh-day Adventism over in Papua New Guinea. So the missionaries are heading over. And guess what draws the most crowd? The medical branch. It's the medical branch. So the medical branch Right here, they have medical tents just on the, on the south side of this picture. And for days and days, thousands and thousands and thousands of people showed up to get physical healing. Now, I've confirmed this. I'm friends with the leaders over there. And I heard of this story. There was a... The eye doctors are really important over there, and so there's a whole group of, of Adventist eye doctors that are over there treating patients, and there's lines to get in to see them. And there's this older lady that my understanding is she's in her mid-60s, and she's been blind for decades, completely blind for decades. She's sitting in line. She sat in line for more than two days to get in to see the eye doctor. While she was sitting in line, guess what happened to her? Her vision was 100% restored. She never saw the eye doctor. That is a confirmed story. 
from, from Ted Wilson. He's over there preaching right now. This is a confirmed story from the teams that are there that this lady was truly blind, just like the, the gentleman that was paralyzed for 38 years at the Pool of Bethesda. This lady is the same case, completely blind, completely healed. God does miraculous healings. It's so amazing when you go on these mission trips to see the joy that's brought to people, the joy on their face when they get a little bit of their suffering relief. But you know what that does? When, when we go over as medical missionaries, it just opens up the spiritual doors. It opens up the spiritual doors. Now, this is actually Elder Wilson's um, meeting site, and everybody there in blue, they're fixing to get baptized, all right? And choir, you guys could go ahead and come up, but here they're fixing to baptize. Now, look at this crowd. This is happening just yesterday, so yesterday was Sabbath for them. So... The crowd is out. Guess how many people have been baptized in Papua New Guinea in the last week alone? Anybody want to throw out a guess? 400,000. 400,000 people have been baptized in the last week alone in Papua New Guinea. Praise the Lord. The latter rain is really happening. What we have to realize is that we have a responsibility. This university is fulfilling that responsibility, producing missionaries. But each one of us can be a missionary in our own homes, in our own communities. We have to understand that this fight for our mind is real and that we're fighting a battle against digital information. But when we go out, people do want healing. We need to pray that we can be a conduit for healing. We can be a conduit. The Lord can work through us. And the Lord can restore sight. The Lord can, he can undo paralysis. He really can. Do we have the faith to let that happen in our own lives? Do we have the faith to let that happen in our own lives? So as we get ready to close here, I want to share one more verse. Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. When we really work for the Lord, our thoughts will be linked to him. Our frontal cortex will be linked to him. All that nastiness that Satan's trying to put in our lives, we can shun it and put it out of our lives. We are no longer part of that incessant scroll age. We're not going to do it any longer. So my friends, I would challenge you today to commit your works to the Lord, to let your thoughts be established, to be a conduit for healing for God, and he will use you for that if you believe in it. If you believe in it. So how many of you here today do want to commit your works to the Lord? How many want to commit your works to the Lord? If we do, then we can rest assured that God will perform spiritual brain surgery on us. He will rewire our brains so that our thoughts are established in him and we can have the mind of Christ. If you would like to have the mind of Christ, I just invite you to stand with me as we have prayer and we get ready to hear our last song. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, you're a God of mercy, of love, of compassion, of healing, and we thank you so much for the love that you give us. Thank you for Jesus and the example he set and the way he healed people. He cared for them mentally, physically, and spiritually. Help for us to follow his example. May we live a life of faith so connected to you that you can use us to perform wonderful healings as well, that we can speak to people in ways that are gentle and compassionate and humble, and we can point the errors out in people's lives in a way that they can turn from the errors that they may come to know you and have the mind of Christ as well. Lord, we love you so much, and we just invite you into our hearts today. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
before our postlude, just a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, I know many of you have already made uh, reservations or you have plans uh, for the lunch hour. For those who uh, didn't have plans or don't have a place to eat, um, Keith uh, will be able to um, help you with a potluck that's going to be at the new gazebo. So only for those that don't have plans and don't have, um, have food, we want you to have plenty of food before the next flight at 5 p.m. Uh, also, uh, for those of you that have not um, uh, had um, or have not uh, seen, I also, uh, there was someone wanting to give the Weimar Magazine to someone else. If you, uh, there are some boxes of the Weimar Magazine around somewhere. Emily, I'm not sure exactly where they are. Uh, but maybe you could point us to where those are at, and if you have someone in mind to receive that, that's a gift uh, for, uh, from Weimar uh, for you. And then the final announcement is the bulletin was inaccurate at the education um, meeting today at 6 p.m. It says Haskell Hall. That will not be at Haskell Hall. That will be here. So the 5 p.m. meeting at here and also the teacher dedication at 6 p.m. And uh, let's uh, thank you for that wonderful message. Also, thank you, musicians, for touching our heart. And uh, let's um, also have that prayerful and reverent attitude as we go in to our postlude to conclude the service. Oh, it's right up here at the front. Thank you, Emily. So if you need a Weimar magazine, uh, feel free to get it here at the front.